Hello. Um, thank you. Thank you, Juan. And uh, thank you, Andreas, Swan, and Olaf for organizing a great workshop. I've really been, I'm not, not surprised, but impressed with the quality of the presentations today. I think it's been a, a great gathering. I'm really thrilled to be part of it. This is my third ISWCI. My first talk was in 2009 when we, uh, we announced the launch of data.mytimes.com, the little corner of our site that we use to publish linked open data. Uh, quick question. Can you hear me in the back of the room? No? All right. I can get closer to the microphone. I just don't want to blast the people up front. All right, great. Uh, so in 2009, we, we, we announced the launch of uh, the Times. And then at the industry track in 2010 in Shanghai, I gave a joint talk with uh, Facebook, which was a lot of fun, but kind of constraining because both of our sites were blocked. Um, I wasn't around, uh, I w I wasn't around uh, for last year's talk. Uh, but this year, I'm thrilled to provide you about three years in to our relationship with linked data at the Times, an update on where we are. Uh, so um, before I get into it, however, I just want to give those of you who might not be familiar with the New York Times operations a little overview of the company, the group that I work in, and what I do at the Times. So I work for the New York Times company, which is a diversified media company that operates four major media brands, uh, the New York Times, the International Herald Tribune, the Boston Globe right here in Boston, and the Worcester Telegram Gazette, which is slightly outside of Boston. Now, for those of you that are not uh, from the region, um, you will note that the Worcester Telegram Gazette is spelled Worcester uh, Telegram Gazette, but never pronounce it Worcester. It is Worcester. If you say Worcester, people will be, well, it's a bad thing. Um, the part of the New York Times company that I work for is the New York Times uh, Research and Development Lab. And the R&D lab at the New York Times has been around since 2006. And our job is to monitor trends in technologies that have the potential to impact or disrupt the news industry in the two to five your time frame, and then to communicate those trends, not through you know, boring PowerPoint slides like I'm subjecting you guys to, but uh, rather through interactive prototypes that, that, that really communicate the, um, uh, the, the sort of essence of an idea and let people play with it and experience it and discover for themselves why technology is compelling. And we've done several of those prototypes around linked data, and I'm going to share some of those with you later. Uh, as for my role in the R&D group, I am the lead architect for semantic platforms and that means that my job is to think about what we can do with the 161-year tradition of knowledge management that we have at the New York Times that's new and exciting but leverages that tradition and builds on it. So I work on efforts around linked data. I work on e efforts for making our website itself more understandable using, uh, using semantic markup. And I also am involved in a number of research collaborations with institutions that are pursuing the vision of the semantic web. So I've, uh, I, I, I'm very lucky to be able to work on those projects. And that's sort of what I do at the New York Times. So now that I have bored you to tears with the organizational situation that, I, that, that is my existence at the New York Times, I'm going to go on and tell you what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the awesome journey of the humble tag at the New York Times as it starts from 1851, following it all the way through to 2012, and then discussing how, Mark, you can sit in my seat. It's open right there with the leather jacket on it. Um, hate to see people sitting on the floor. Um, uh, so we're going to start with the, with, with the with the story of how we've done tagging at the New York Times for 161 years. Then I'm going to talk about how the tags that we use have been linked, how we've put them to work. And I'm going to close with a thought about how the work that we're doing at just the New York Times might be able to be the seed of something that could be spread more broadly throughout the news industry. So I'm going to tell you about the awesome journey of the humble tag with an asterisk um, at, at the New York Times. Uh, so let me introduce you to the tag. Meet the tag. Um, the tag is the strongest knowledge organization principle that we have at the New York Times. And when I say tag, I mean something very specific. Um, and I don't like it when people read slides, but I'm only I, I promise this will be like the only thing I read verbatim. But when I say tag, I mean a consistent string used to indicate that an authority or a subject is a principal topic of a news article, which is to say a tag is a consistent string that we, we assign to, assi to indicate that an article is about a person, a place, an organization, or a descriptor. And when I say descriptor, I mean uh, basically anything that isn't an identity, um, anything that isn't a proper noun. So a descriptor can be something like uh, eggs or the Iraq war. Uh, so that is what I mean by descriptors. And this idea of tagging has really 
uh, knit together all of the many, many decades of knowledge management that go on at the New York Times. And that tag's journey starts on September 18th, 1851 which is when we published the very first edition of the New York Times, which you can see behind that title. The very first edition of the New York Times um, has a couple of interesting features. One is that we hyphenated New York, and we stopped doing that uh, a little bit afterwards. Also, we were the New York Daily Times when we first started, uh, but we're now just the New York Times without a hyphen. But that's not the point of this presentation. The point of the presentation is that even in the days where it was just paper, um, and it was a relatively young newspaper, there were still serious knowledge management problems that the organization had to address. After all, we published newspapers, and when we wrote subsequent editions, it was helpful for the, for the journalistic staff of the New York Times, even in the 1850s, to be able to see all of the previous stories that concerned a subject that had been covered in the paper before. Uh, and sadly for them, the general purpose electronic computer wouldn't be invented for nearly a century. But even so, they got assignments like this. You know, say that your editor in 1858 said, you know what, it's the 10th anniversary of the passing of our sixth president, John Quincy Adams. I want you to write a profile about him. And because you, as a reporter in 1858, did not have the luxury of Google or LexisNexis or other information resources that might have helped you answer questions that you would need answered to write this piece, you would refer back to our internal index, which was organized on the principle of tags. Here is the internal index you would have referred to. This is a copy of the handwritten index that we used at the New York Times. Um, this index covers the period 1851 to 1858, so exactly the period you're going to need to write your story about John Quincy Adams. And if you look at the page carefully, that is the art those are the articles that we wrote about him and indexed that way and that we tagged using that tag. So I know the whole idea of tagging documents is very much in vogue right now, but it's also something that has been going on for a very long time, especially at the New York Times. And once you had found the, 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 the collection of documents that you were searching for, you would be directed to a, car, to a filing cabinet in a room that came to be known as the morgue at the New York Times. And what the morgue was was a place where we put all of the articles filed away by the subjects that we tagged them with so that reporters could go in there, open up a file drawer, find a manila envelope with all the articles about a subject, and do their research. The morgue looked like this. This was our, uh, I affectionately call, this is, I think, around 19. Um, I affectionately call this the analog database of the New York Times. Uh, and this database, uh, like any good database, had a process to keep it updated and consistent. That process looked like this. These are uh, people working in the 30s, I believe, in the New York Times morgue to file away stories that have been cut out and categorized using tags. So originally, we tagged at the New York Times to, uh, to uh, buttress our journalism with superior research to our competitors. But by the time, after many decades of doing this, it occurred to the then publisher of the New York Times, a gentleman named Adolf Ox, that we had this incredible internal data resource and that it could be leveraged to bring value not only internally, but also externally in the form of a publicly available index to the New York Times. This had the added benefit of positioning the New York Times in 1913, 100 years ago, uh, or almost 100 years ago, uh, as, the, uh, as the paper of record. And in fact, that was sort of the explicit mission behind releasing an index. So in 1913, the tag went from an internal resource to an external product called the New York Times Index, which in those days was issued quarterly. And if you wanted to consult the index, this is the, this is the second edition. I couldn't find the first. So this is the second quarterly edition in 1913 when it came out. And these were the, all of the libraries. This is, a fun, this is a fun page. It's hard to see. I apologize for those of you in the back of the room. All the libraries in America where you could find a copy of the index and a copy of the archives to answer your search query with. So before we had Google, before we had Google News, before we had LexisNexis, you had these libraries you could go to and do the uh, exact same thing, albeit a little more slowly and at the risk of paper cuts. So this is uh, the New York Times index. And so suppose you, in 1913, had decided that you wanted to release uh, to, to, to Research John Quincy Adams again. He's going to be a recurring theme in this talk. I'm going to turn off the air conditioner real quick so you uh, so you can hear me. It should turn down in a second. I apologize for that interruption. So let's say in 1913 you decided that you wanted to write a report about John Quincy Adams. Well, our index could help you answer that question. So there is uh, there is our print index, and unlike our old index, it's typewritten now. So our index is a little more professional. And in the 
early part of the, of the 20th century, you would have used this index to locate the articles that you were looking for in, rag, in bound rag paper editions of the New York Times. Before Microfish, we sold these, we, we printed the contents of the paper on low acid paper, we bound it, and then we sold those to libraries. Uh, and that's how you would find the articles that the index was directing you to. Of course, um, as I'm sure you all know, in the 1930s, the New York Times did a joint research product with Kodak, uh, pro, pro, uh, project with Kodak and the New York Public Library, the result of which was microfilm. And microfilm became the way that we distributed the archives in the later years. But the problem with print indexes and microfilms is so obvious that it's almost easy to miss. And that is that print indexes don't let you do Boolean queries. So if you wanted to read all of the articles that concerned John Quincy Adams and St. Petersburg, Russia, where, as I'm sure you all know, he was the ambassador, um, you, you would have to find all of the articles about John Quincy Adams in the index and then manually do an or with all of the articles about St. Petersburg in the same period, and that is an that is an onerous process and beyond, and really difficult to do, especially for popular topics. Fortunately, uh, digital computers don't suffer from that limitation. So in March 28th of 1969, the New York Times decided to take its index online. It announced the very first New York Times information bank. It was announced in 1969. It, uh, went, it became available uh, in 1972 and was operated for many, many years, and basically, um, this, so this is one article I found about it. This one I like even more. This is another article about the information bank that appeared in the New York Times uh, on the 27th of March. And it says of uh, electronic news that it is a potentially big market. So you have to congratulate them on their foresight. So the it Times Information Bank was a service that was developed uh, under the direction of this gentleman right, right here. His name is John Rothman. He was the director of library and information services at the New York Times. And I, I apologize to Mr. Rothman. That was the best picture I could find of him. He is uh, incidentally still living and volunteering in New York Public Libraries. So he has a long tradition of doing great things with libraries. And the, uh, the move to the Information Bank started, again, around the tag. Because in 1965, we started to move the New York Times Index away from their manual analog uh, indexing process to these beautiful systems right here. And the indexers started to index the times on a mainframe uh, instead of in paper. And the mainframe they used to index, these are all actual pictures of the real systems. So this is the indexer typing into his console where he's indexing and tagging the articles. Um, and it was stored on this IBM System 370 mainframe, which was operated by this gentleman right here, which was stored in this room and made available, to the, uh, made available to the newsroom of the New York Times on their desks using these terminals. And these terminals had a remarkably sophisticated feature that I think is really interesting. Once they had searched the index, found the tag and the article they wanted to see, these terminals had a button called Show Me the Fish. Uh, that would not, that's F-I-C-H-E, not F-I-S-H. There was no fish actually displayed. Um, the, uh, the, uh, so you push the button, and it would cause a microfilm reader in the basement to pull the microfiche that, was the appropriate, that had the article you were interested in. It would place it in front of a closed circuit television camera and beam the image of that microfiche up to your desk. So that was how they did full text search. Well, it wasn't full text. It was just using the index. But that was how they did information retrieval in 1972 at the New York Times. Um, and this wasn't just something we did internally. The New York Times Information Bank was a service that we sold externally. It would cost you once all factors were considered between, uh, and these are in 2012 dollars. In 2012 dollars, it would cost you between 58 and 60, I don't know, 52 and 68 thousand uh, dollars to operate, uh, to, to, to have this installed at your site. But a number of people did. And the first site to install the New York Times Information Bank was the University of Pittsburgh. And I believe this is a picture of their, of their installation. And you will note something interesting about this picture. There is a book on top of the computer that says Thesaurus. And that book enumerates all of the queries that you are allowed to type into the system. Um, the, the query only understood, a, the system only understood a subset, uh, it only understood our index. So that book let you know what the terms of the index were that you were allowed to feed into the system. And the other cool thing about this picture is the acoustic coupler in the foreground. So that is, uh, they, they, the way the system worked was that you dialed into the mainframe at the New York Times headquarters. So that was the modem that you would use. And like the print index, you could use this 
to find out about our friend John Quincy Adams, who you will see displayed on the screen right there. That, that, that's Photoshop. That didn't really happen. Um, the, so the, that, is, that is the New York Times information make. And in addition to the University of Pittsburgh, we sold it to a number of companies and government agencies. And since this is a scientific conference, I owe you at least one table. This is a table that I dug up that was published in 1975 about the hourly usage patterns of those three different categories of customers. Uh, the, uh, and this was uh, on a monthly basis. So on average, the government had the highest uh, utilization of the service at 32.4 hours a week, uh, a month rather, uh, on average. And the corporate usage was the lowest at 15.6. Uh, so make, make, uh, make, make your own conclusions, but that's my data table. Uh, so the New York Times Information Bank was operated by the Times from uh, 1972 to 1983. And the Times then sold it to the Mead Data Corporation, which integrated it with a bunch of other systems and renamed the whole thing Lexis, oh, excuse me, Nexus, um, and was then sold to Reed Elsevier in 1994. And the Foundational components of the Times Information Bank do live on today in uh, in, uh, in Reed Elsevier's LexisNexis products. So that was the first move of the tags at the New York Times into the digital realm. Uh, but as you uh, as you as you all know, the New York Times on January nineteenth, nineteen ninety six, took another big step into the digital realm with the launch of NYTimes.com, or as we called it then, NY the New York Times on the web. Here is a picture of an early front page of the New York Times. The thing I really like about this site that I think is great, uh, something more sites should do today, is that at the bottom of the, of, of the site, it says, please open your window to the width of this line of text. <laughs> because uh, they didn't know how to use the center tag. Um, and uh, they discovered that uh, about three or four months into the, into the experiment and, and, and took that warning out. But that was the original New York Times website. It was a single image with an image map on top of it that you could click on to get uh, articles. Uh, and uh, that website has evolved substantially since then. That's uh, yesterday's website. And the tags that we do at the New York Times continue to form a really integral part of our operations on the web. Uh, I, I want to let you know, and, and so it doesn't get lost in the shuffle, we still make a print index. We still have an indexing staff. That all still goes on. But there's a whole separate process on the web that uses the same vocabulary to tag the articles, because the index um, is, is published on a cycle that isn't real time. We need metadata before the article goes online. So we tag all the articles on our website with that that same vocabulary. And the process that we use to tag the articles is manually supervised. So every single tag that we apply to an article on our website is vetted by a human being. Uh, and why do we go through all this trouble? Well, we use tags today at the New York Times to power a number of features on our site, including article recommendations, news alerts, RSS and syndication. You might be surprised about the article recommendations bit. The way the uh, recommendation engine works at the New York Times is that we model a user's browsing history of a distribution of visits over topics or tags. And then we use that to find articles that are in a similar, we find, uh, that we find articles that are a good fit with the user's distribution of tag visits. So the tags form the backbone of our recommendation engine. Uh, we also use tags to power our topic pages, which are our landing pages that do topical aggregations for about 40,000 different things that we write about at the New York Times. The examples I have here are North Korea's nuclear program, Al Franken, and the US Supreme Court. And of course, I have the example. This is uh, John Quincy Adams' topic page. And uh, not, particularly, uh, not a particularly beautiful topic page, but it would lead you to this really cool article called John Quincy Adams. Twitterer. Um, and it turns out he wrote very short diary entries. So they started Twittering them out. Um, so that is a really, really brief survey of the role that the humble tag has played in the uh, knowledge management operations of the New York Times for the last 160 years. And because we've been doing this for 160 years, we can show you some really cool visualizations of our archive. So I decided, you know, a few, uh, a few months ago uh, to finally build something that was suggested to me by an employee at the Times who's no longer uh, with the organization, which was, wouldn't it be cool if we could take a grid where each pixel represented a day in the archive and plot out how tags were used throughout the archive? So the way you can understand the images I'm about to show you are that uh, the, the upper left-hand corner is uh, uh, January 1st, 1851. And you walk across on the x-axis, and that's a day in the year. And the bottom uh, right-hand corner is December 31st, 2012. So each pixel represents a day. And we'll take a look at what some of the tags that we've applied for 161 years look like in that context. So 
Here's the first one. This is Russia. And again, I apologize for people in the back of the room. The tags are shaded according to how frequently they were applied on that day. And you will notice that it seems that we weren't consistent. There's a big gap in the middle between 1919 and 1991 where we're not tagging Russia. And uh, the reason for that is that we didn't tag Russia. We tagged the Soviet Union during that time period. So the, you can see history reflected in the metadata, which is what I love about this visualization. And then you can take a look at Iraq which uh, starts in the 1850s. And I believe, um, somebody correct me if my history is wrong on this, that Iraq was one of those treaty countries around World War I that came into existence. Uh, and so you see around, 19, uh, around the middle of the, uh, uh, the, the 19-teens, uh, Iraq begins to show up in our data. And of course, you can see there are bright stripes in the data where, uh, you know, where, the, near, where the United States had its wars in Iraq. Um, Another one that I like uh, is the distribution of the tag bobsledding over our archive. You can, look, you can see here, that stripe on the left-hand corner is winter. Uh, and uh, you can also notice some periodicity. There are some years where we don't talk about it. And it seems that every four years in the winter, for some reason, we mention bobsledding. And the last uh, couple I'm going to show you are give you an idea of what a significant life looks like in the archive of the New York Times. So this is George, uh, George Bush the Elder. And this is George Bush, his son. So you can see that a significant life um, is, uh, it, it, you know, when you look at it in the context of like the history of a nation, uh, a life, no matter how significant, even the United States president, is just a pretty narrow band in our archive. Um, and then the last one I have to show you is Columbus Day. Uh, which I think is an interesting tag because it looks, I haven't actually done the research because I'm lazy, but um, it looks like at some point there was a lot of discussion of the idea of Columbus Day. And then after we had that discussion, it occurs roughly every year on the same time. Uh, so that's what you can do when you have 160 years of tags. So to just review here, um, we started out with a manual index in, 19, in 1851 that was written by hand. We moved in 1913 to a digital index, and 19, I'm sorry, 1913 to a print index, in 1969 to a digital index, and in 1996 through today, we've been doing this. Uh, we've been doing this both online and in print, and it's a critical part of our operations. But as the LinkedIn enthusiasts in this room have no doubt already guessed. There is a problem with our approach to knowledge management. We live on the island of the New York Times in our terms of our knowledge management. We live in our own namespace. We call Barack Obama, Obama comma Barack. We call, uh, we call Brooklyn, Brooklyn parentheses, NYC. We have our own parochial names for things. And um, I don't need to tell this, this room that there are a lot of different names for the same thing on the web. So I realized uh, this and in collaboration, uh, and just to give you an example of this, uh, let's consider the 44th president of the United States, Barack Obama, uh, in the New York Times archive, we call him this. Um, Wikipedia calls him Barack underscore Obama. And I'm sure Denny will give us an even better new name for Barack Obama when, uh, the, Wikidata, when the Wikidata cross language links catch on. Um, the Library of Congress calls him that. Amazon calls him that. Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Facebook, there are a lot of different names for the same thing on the web. We all are familiar with this problem. A lot of us spend most of our day thinking about this problem. And I, too, have thought about this problem. And I have two solutions to propose. Uh, the first is that we could get everybody on planet Earth to always call the same thing the same thing. Or we could, we could follow Sir Tim Berners-Lee's advice and map the strong identifiers from our database onto other big databases. And despite the fact that I feel the Times does wield considerable influence, the first approach seemed untenable. So we decided to go with the second approach. And on July 6, 2009, at the Semantic Technology Conference, uh, one of my bosses, the Vice President for Search Products, Rob Larson, announced that the New York Times was going to release the vocabularies that it uses to index its articles and, uh, and integrate them into the linked open data cloud. So how, did we go, so, so how do we go about going from this digital set of tags that's parochial and internal to the New York Times to open linked data that, that, that's useful to the rest of the world? So what we did was we took a, we looked at our, uh, the tags that we use in our index, and we decided we're going to focus on the ones that we use to make topic pages, and we're going to map them in order of how many articles have been written about them. And using that strategy, we took those tags and mapped them all to Wikipedia for every single category type. 
Um, but we didn't. Uh, uh, and then once we were mapped to Wikipedia, we could programmatically resolve those tags to DBpedia and Freebase. And then we also, for the geographic tags, mapped them to GeoNames. And if you're doing geographic stuff and you haven't gone to geonames.org, I encourage you to stop listening to my talk and go there right now. It's an incredible resource. Um, the, uh, so we've been doing this uh, for about three years now. I have two uh, digital librarians at the Times uh, whose names deserve to be mentioned because they're heroes, Christy O'Reilly and Jennifer Perucci, who are in there when they're not making sure the, ta the site is tagged correctly in their spare time are mapping these, uh, uh, mapping these tags to Wikipedia and uh, GeoNames. And going down that road, we have mapped a total of 14,000 of the tags that we use to index the New York Times to these linked open data sources. Um, and that's 2,300 locations, 5,000 people, 4,000 descriptors, and 3,000 organizations. So we're beginning to have a very rich set of linked data that we can make available at the New York Times. And the way that we do this mapping is that I wrote what I think is a truly beautiful piece of software that shows Wikipedia on one side and the New York Times on the other uh, for a given tag and displays my best guess as to what the proper alignment for the tag is, I use an extremely sophisticated algorithm to suggest the first Wikipedia page, which, which is I Google for it, every, restrict the results to Wikipedia, and show the first one. And uh, it turns out, as a strategy for uh, reconciling linked data, uh, at least in our case, that works pretty well. It's probably right. This is anecdotal, not this is a, my anecdotal impression, not a scientific fact. But my impression is that it's right 90% or so of the time. Um, um, straight off the bat to using this approach. And uh, for our places, we search GeoNames directly, and we show on a map the various things from GeoNames that match the tag and then let, the, uh, and let our librarians manually disambiguate. So that's how we get our linked data. And data.ny times is how we give you the linked data. It's a section of the site where we have taken uh, most of the tags that we have mapped, and more will be coming. Uh, and release them as linked open data using uh, principle, using many of the verbs in the SCOS vocabulary, and uh, in in order to be good citizens of the linked data cloud, uh, we release this data on this portion of our site. Uh, under a Creative Commons attributions license, which is somewhat unusual for a media company to do. But we felt that when it comes to the terms that we've used to index our content for the last 150 years, 160 years, um, the value is not in the terms. They're the map. You know, the, the content itself is the treasure. So we felt that releasing this would just give people novel ways of approaching this treasure and finding new things in it. So I think this combination of releasing our documents, uh, providing them in a structured form, uh, making HTTP URIs available and releasing them under an open data license, if you consider Creative Commons attributions to be an open data license, puts us in the uh, club of five-star data sets. So I'm very pleased with uh, data.nytimes.com. And everybody in the semantic web community seems to be happy that we've gone down this route. It turns out, however, that the web consists of not just the semantic web community. And a lot of developers don't have the motivation or interest to sort of unpack this full stack of semantic web technologies. But we didn't want to wall them off from the quality of this quality data. Um, so what we've done, in addition to data.nytimes.com, is that in December of last year, we released a, uh, a couple of different APIs. Um, they're just RESTful, XML uh, RESTful, RESTful APIs that return JSON or XML. Um, that, that we call them our semantic APIs. Uh, that return the same data, essentially, that's on data.nytimes.com, but using conventions that developers are more familiar with. So we didn't want to wall people off from the power of linked data, but we wanted to give an opportunity for people who aren't willing to take the whole plunge and learn the whole stack. Into, it, we wanted to give them the opportunity to discover the value of mapping your strong identifiers to external uh, strong identifiers. And if you want to play with, uh, develop, uh, with our um, let me sh turn off Miriam here for just a second. And there it is. There's a little corner called our API console where you can test out the semantic API for yourself. So if I wanted to say, give me all the things that, uh, give me the full details about the New York Times concept, computers and, um, it's not going to work. I'm going I'm to spell it wrong. I'll just use terrorism. Um, and give me all of the fields 
here is our API response. So this is JSON. It's not RDF. It's just something that we provide to developers so that they can use this linked data to. Um, gives the name of the concept, but it gives the links. It's the same as this thing from Freebase. It's the same as this thing from Wikipedia. And we also publish our taxonomies. So uh, let's see. Uh, Terrorism Risk Insurance Act is a narrower term. Abu Ghraib is a related term. World Trade Center is a related term. We publish our, uh, our taxonomy, too. And we also give you the articles that match the tag and a query you can throw into our search API, which is another API I don't have time to talk about, that would let you get back the articles that correspond to this tag. So we publish our linked data both as a website and as a, as a RESTful service. And we have been doing, so we've had the website for about three years. We've had the RESTful service for a little less than a year. And we have decided from what we've observed that there's sufficient value in this linked data app exercise that we wanted to integrate it into our content management system. So this is something new. I haven't, I haven't talked about this before. But at the New York Times, we have begun to integrate linked data not just into these external facing systems and around the edges, but it's actually being integrated into our content management system now. We have built a tool for our online our, our digital librarians to control the terms that we use to index the site that we naturally called Terminator. <laughs> so Terminator is a tool that is part of our CMS now. Uh, and the way that Terminator uh, is set up is we have um, a database. Uh, it's a MySQL database that stores all the tags, their mapping, and all the other metadata around, that, uh, around, around them um, that are exposed through a PHP uh, API called the Semantic API. Uh, and then that feeds into the CMS component, which is called Terminator, which allows our digital librarians to specify relations between our tags and external data resources directly into our content management system. Um, the system also supports a uh, dictionary generation process. And the reason that's there is that when we tag on the web, we actually use a rule-based information extraction system called Teragram to suggest tags to, our, to the people who do the tagging. Um, and then they review them and, prove, and approve the ones that are correct. This system, uh, Terminator, is actually going to be responsible now for generating those extraction dictionaries. So not only do we have linked data, but we have the information extraction in one place as well. And over the next uh, few months, we hope to move these data mapping tools that I showed you earlier that we use to specify the alignments onto this platform. And we also uh, plan to move data.nytimes.com from being a flat HTML site, which is what it is today, to a dynamic site that's based on this platform. So the linked data that we, we, we create will be published immediately. So to give you a little bit of insight into what Terminator looks like, if you wanted to, say, edit the tag for, oh, I don't know, John Quincy Adams, uh, you would type it in. Uh, and I apologize to people in the back, this, or even people in the front. This is hard to see. Uh, and the system has. Three tabs, essentially. This is the term tag, which lets you give it a name and specify its type. Is it a person, a place, an organization? Uh, and then we have this tag called Teragram, which lets you specify the complex extraction rules that our information extraction system uses to identify these concepts in free text. And then the last tab on this is the most interesting, I think, to this crowd, which is the links tab, which enumerates all of the links between our concept of John Quincy Adams and external data sets that we have identified um, that use the same term. So, that is Terminator. We're really excited about it. And it isn't the only thing that we're doing with semantic technology at the New York Times, but it's one of the, it's one of the most exciting um, from my perspective. Uh, but there is some related work that's, uh, work that's worth mentioning. These are separate presentations in and of themselves, so I'm just going to touch on them briefly. Another thing that we've been doing at the New York Times with semantic technology is that we are a member at the New York Times of an international media digital standards body called the International Press Telecommunications Council. And uh, over the last several years, we've worked together to develop a, uh, a data model uh, and a, 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 for expressing publishing metadata in HTML documents. We realized uh, once RDFA started to, uh, started to really catch on that we wanted as a publishing industry to be able to leverage the power of that standard to express things like this is the headline of the article. Um, and there wasn't a standard vocabulary for doing that. There are a bunch of different vocabularies that one could map together to accomplish that end, but we thought it would be useful to have a unified standard just for news. Um, so the IPTC worked uh, to develop this data model called R News. We uh, released it last year, or yeah, late last, or I think it was, no, it was, uh, we released it in, in, um, in uh, 2000 and. Uh, 10, I think. And then we worked with, uh, when schema.org was announced, we worked with them to integrate the uh, R News data model into the model that schema.org provides. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that with 
two or three differences, the entire model that the IPTC developed, developed um, was adopted by schema.org, which involved, I think, about 40 properties being added to the, to the vocabulary. So there is a much richer semantic representation of news in schema.org now because of work that went on uh, involving the New York Times. And we're really proud, of that, proud about that. Another semantic project that we're involved with, um, in fact, I'm involved with two of the folks sitting in this room on this project, um, is called XLIKE, which stands for Cross Language Knowledge Extraction. It's a Framework 7 program. Um, uh, funded by the European Commission. And the idea behind the X-Like uh, project, and both of you, you know, shake your heads violently if I have this wrong, is to develop technology that can monitor, that, 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 that can identify uh, e events and topics in a stream, stream of multilingual data uh, across both traditional and social media so that we can do interesting aggregations and explorations of news content, not just in one language, but in languages across the globe. And the New York Times participates in this project as a, uh, as a as, what, what's the official term? An expert advisor? Or? Associate advisor. Associated member. So our role in the project is um, to provide guidance on how we, how we would believe it would be helpful for the technology to develop. So that is the sort of survey of linked data stuff that's going on at the New York Times. But since I am uh, an employee of a corporation, and since this stuff has to justify itself in that context, I thought I'd share a little bit of you, a bit with you, why we think linked data is good in not only a social positive internet context, but also in, in a business context. And there are three things in the New York Times that we think linked data is really helpful with. Uh, the first is adding ontological context. Uh, the second is automated data alignment. And the third is non-traditional aggregation. And what I mean when I say adding ontological context, uh, we have a problem with geography at the Times, which is that it is our tradition to tag articles using the most specific term uh, that describes the geography they're about. So if an article is about, uh, say, Rome, it will get tagged Rome, but it won't get tagged Italy. And as a consequence, if you were on an email feed for Italy, you wouldn't get an email saying this is an article about Italy because it was tagged Rome. But GeoNames tells us that Rome is in Italy. So using linked data, we can broaden the context of the terms that we already have and do more dynamic things than we were capable of before. Another thing that um, uh, linked data helps us with is automatically aligning data. So even at the New York Times, uh, this problem of two names for the same thing is a problem. Uh, we have a Congress API, uh, which lets you see all the votes of a member of Congress uh, based on their uh, congressional bio ID. And we have a search API that lets you, and a semantic API that lets you retrieve information about this individual based on this tag. So we have this funny situation at the Times where both, uh, where Al Franken is in two different databases with two different names. But it turns out the congressional bio ID being a public identifier that is well understood on the web was mapped on Freebase, and we've mapped our tags to Freebase. So we're able to automatically reconcile these two different data sets without actually having to do the job ourselves. Uh, we took a look at it to make sure it was right, but it was basically right. Um, and then the last thing that linked data does that I really like is it enables us to do non-traditional aggregations of our content. It lets us do, you know, traditionally we could take a tag and show you all the articles that that tag were about. That was the that was the wow moment in all of the examples I showed you um, at the beginning of this presentation was all the articles that match a tag. But with linked data, we can expand the context and do really interesting things we weren't able to do before. I mean, you've all seen news maps before, right? You know, you know, let's put a pin on a map where something happened. Uh, this is a news map. But our news map uses linked data to do something we've never seen a news map do before. So here are all the articles about a place. And I chose Xi'an, China, for this example. So that, that is pretty standard. You've seen this before. But using linked data, we know that Xi'an is mapped to this thing in, in Freebase. And Freebase can tell us who's from Xi'an. So we can show you on the map not only articles about the place, but articles about people who are from the place, or, head, or companies that were headquartered in the place. There are other sorts of non-traditional aggregations that we've explored over the years. One is called alumni in the news. Um, and the idea there is that Freebase, for a lot of universities, has who went there. Um, and so we built a little application that lets you specify the name of a university and shows you all the alumni of that university and the articles about them. Another one, I think perhaps the most important thing that I've ever done as a professional at the New York Times is this application uh, called Standing Tall. It turns out that Freebase has the height of a lot of people. And uh, of the people we mapped, there was about 1,500 that their height were, was in Freebase. So I decided that the world would, I couldn't sleep until the world had a tool for browsing the historical archive of the New York Times based on the height of the people mentioned in the articles. It will not surprise you to learn that, uh, that uh, figure skaters constitute the bulk of the low end of the curve and basketball players are at the other extreme. But uh, it, it, more seriously, I, I actually want to show you something that I, 
that is not released yet, um, but is, I think, the best, exam uh, best demonstration yet we've had of applying these principles of linked data. However, I have to be on my VPN to do that. So I'm going to log on to my VPN right now. But the thing I'm going to show you is called, is, is called uh, C also. And it is the, I think, the sort of best example yet we have of how you can use the principles of linked data to create a compelling news experience around the topics that we've been using at the Times. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, so here's C also. And I've pulled up the C also page for John Quincy Adams. Oh, yeah, it has video mirroring. Sorry, I don't know much about computers. There we go. Um, the, uh, so here is um, uh, C also. Uh, and what we've done here is we've loaded up John Quincy Adams. And we're displaying all the different data sources that we're querying to construct this page. So we were able to dynamically discover um, that uh, here's some pictures of uh, John Quincy Adams from uh, Wikimedia Commons. Um, these are articles that we have written about John Quincy Adams, and it's all Ajaxy, so you can load more articles if you want to see them. Uh, here is the first paragraph of the article uh, from Wikipedia about him. Uh, using, using Freebase, we were able to figure out books that he's written. So if you wanted to say, uh, buy the diary of uh, John Quincy Adams from Amazon and uh, give us a referral fee, that would be OK with us. Um, we have uh, biographical facts pulled from him uh, from Freebase, and we're very eager um, for Wikipedia for Wikidata to, to data data eyes the uh, um, the information box on, on Wikipedia, so we can pull those in as well. And we have the frequently co-occurring uh, people, so you can uh, not only uh, view uh, you know view this subject, but you can actually constrain it to to see a little bit more. So if we want to read about John Ad John Quincy Adams and the presidents in the presidency, we click on that, and these are the articles that are about those two subjects, and we can we can refine it even further. So if we want to say John Quincy Adams presidency and the president and the New York Historical Society, that's the one article that satisfies those criteria, and we pull those off and go back to the. Uh, well, what is the number in this application? Now, the 2,999,000 articles about everything. So that is C also. And of course, you don't have to look at John Quincy Adams, although I think he's a fine fellow. Um, you can look at other things, like uh, presidents of the presidency, and change that to the center of this experience. And we query the linked data cloud and can create a dynamic experience around that topic. Or say, um, the Supreme Court. Or maybe that's not your thing. Maybe the state of California. And all of this is assembled dynamically at runtime from linked data without any more curation than saying this thing in the New York Times is the same as this Wikipedia article on this free, in this GeoNames thing. The rest happens completely automatically. So it's a really, really powerful tool I think, for presenting a valuable context around news. So that's, that's C also. And I know I'm over time. So I'm just going to very briefly say that our next steps at the New York Times with linked data are to complete and deploy this Terminator uh, application. It's almost ready for our CMS. It's not quite there yet. Uh, we're going to release that C also thing that I showed you as a public beta. I don't have a time on that, but that's on our roadmap. Uh, and we're going to migrate the, tab ma the tag mapping infrastructure and data.nytimes.com from the uh, prototype hardware, which they're living on now, to use our production system so that da uh, linked data is updated in real time. And long term, we want to investigate uh, additional vocabularies that we can map the New York Times tags to, because we found great value in doing it uh, with Wikipedia, but we think there are other controlled vocabularies, particularly the Library of Congress subject headings and authorities that we think could be very helpful to align our data set with. So that is uh, linked data at the New York Times in a nutshell. I uh, really appreciate you giving me such a great audience. And I think I have time for a couple of quick questions now. <laughs>